So yes, I, my name is Maggie Breslin, um, and I've been kind of working in the healthcare space for about almost 20 years now. And I'm a little bit of a weirdo in healthcare because my background is as a uh, designer and a uh, researcher. And so for the last, um, for about the last almost 20 years, I have uh, spent a lot of time observing visits in the hospital and the outpatient clinic, routine visits, like regular exams, and I've been there for moments with patients and clinicians when they discovered they have a life-altering disease. Um, I have, uh, as a designer, my work has been to try and understand what's happening in those moments and then to think about how could this space be designed better to help support what's happening in this uh, room or in the, this outpatient room or this hospital room? Um, what kind of tools could we bring into the space that might help uh, the conversation that's happening with clinicians and patients? And, uh, and everything in between, policies and um, uh, reporting structures and really all of that has kind of been my domain as a designer to think about what could we be doing to make it easier for care to happen? And when Holly reached out to me about maybe being the keynote speaker here, you know, she said, and the event is focusing on health literacy. And I thought, do I know anything about health literacy? Because <laughs> I don't think of myself necessarily as kind of an expert uh, or, you know, a person who sort of focuses in that area. Um, and the speakers before I thought were so perfect because I think that they kind of ground this work fundamentally health literacy is very much about conversation it's about communication and so as I was thinking about it of course it's 2022 so I was listening to a podcast and um, I came across uh, this woman sort of speaking on that podcast talking about thinking about redefining health literacy really as fundamentally about conversation and communication between um, clinicians and patients. And that really resonated with me because my biggest insight uh, from um, my almost 20 years, let's see, has been that um, is, is about conversation. That if you, were, if you could take healthcare and you could boil it down to its smallest little molecule, it would be clinician and a patient together in some way trying to work through a problem or situation that they're dealing with. And I think that's what health literacy is essentially a factor of that. As a, to be health literate, for that moment to be health literate, the clinicians need to be able to understand what's going on with their patients. They need to understand what their patients are expert about, which is their lives. And the patients need to be able to understand what the clinicians are bringing into that, into that space, which is their medical knowledge, certainly their clinical knowledge, but also the experiences that they've had. And it's really about what do we do uh, in those spaces where we come together, that that's care. You know, care happens in conversation. And so that is really what the organization that I work for now is a, is a nonprofit called The Patient Revolution. And its mission is to draw attention to and create space for us to critique and turn away from what we call industrial healthcare, which is a, a model for healthcare that's less focused on making sure that care is what happens in that space and has in increasingly become defined by in, uh, business outcomes, industrial outcomes. And instead to have us collectively, clinicians, patients, and everyone turn towards careful and kind care, which is we refer to it as care for this patient, not patients like this. Um, and I think you start to see that come through in the video that we saw before and um, kind of what uh, uh, in the discussions and the stories that were shared, right? So I may be a person that has Medicaid as my insurance, but that doesn't define me completely about who I am and what's going on with me. And so care is a conversation. This is, this is how we think of the industrial healthcare kind of frame right now. Um, so right now, a lot of what happens in healthcare is um, that conversations, care is essentially a product it's something that clinicians and patients manufacture on the factory floor of healthcare, which is often a visit room. 
And in this environment, what happens in order to make that a product, because the idea behind a product is essentially each one kind of looks similar, right? It looks the same. And that's often so it can kind of be turned and shown to payers and say, here's what we did. Um, does this meet the requirements that were, that were necessary in order for you know, payment to happen? And what happens in those spaces, it's unintentional, but um, by the nature of creating it as a product, that we limit the information and the stories that patients can share. Um, we limit time and resources that clinicians may be able to kind of bring to those environments. And we limit the number of problems and, and situations that patients are really um, allowed to bring into that space and that clinicians feel they have the capacity and, and resources to be able to respond to. And what happens in those environments is that patients start to feel like a blur. They're not necessarily seen and heard. And clinicians start to get distanced from their sense of purpose, from the reason why they went into healthcare to begin with, and that often is a contributing factor to burnout, which I'm sure, you know, certainly COVID-19 uh, COVID has only exacerbated that kind of feeling and, and this kind of model. And as a researcher, one of the things I can tell you about this model of care um, is that in this environment, when you go and look and you observe, one of the ways that you can kind of tell that um, industrial healthcare is, is sort of overwhelming a particular clinic or space is that most of the conversations look the same. So people who all have diabetes, uh, who are dealing with um, hypertension, their conversations are gonna look similar, right, when you compare them to each other. And that's a challenge, right, because the people who come through those doors, as we just heard from all of these stories, are not the same. They come from different life experiences, they have different things going on, um, they may have different wants or needs or desires or goals or things they want to do with their lives, and all of those should inform the type of treatment and care that they have. And so what we are trying to do as an organization is to think about the role of care happening in conversations is being more of a, a care is just a byproduct of being able to bring the clinician and patient together and giving them the resources and the ability to deal with the situation that presents itself um, in that particular moment in time. Uh, what is that patient needing to kind of grapple with and sort of manage? And in this environment, what we think about what's important is it's important that we create space not only for the patient's biography, I'm sorry, their biology, which might be everything that we can find in the electronic health record and the labs that they just went to have done, but also their biography, who are they as a person, uh, what's important to them, what else is going on in their lives, uh, what do they feel like is their uh, access to resources and sort of capacity. And then for clinicians, we think it's really about unhurried conversations. Um, can we create the space, which doesn't mean long, right? I think unhurried means that we've created the appropriate amount of time and space that's necessary for the, these two people to come together and manage the issues that they're dealing with. You can start to think about unhurried conversations and imagine that if you really invest in um, uh, continuity, um, then you start to see how efficiency could start to play out, right? If you begin to give a clinician, clinician or a care team and a patient time to really know and understand each other maybe a little bit more at the beginning, as they move through their time of caring for each other, they might be able to do a lot more things on the phone, through the patient portal. They may not need to kind of come in. There's not as much repetition. You don't have to start from the beginning and kind of tell these whole stories. So it's not that unheard conversations is necessary antithetical to efficiency, but it's a different type of efficiency. It's modeled on what's important to the clinician and the patient, as opposed to maybe what might be important to the organization. And then really what you see happen, oh sorry, <laughs> what you see happen here and uh, when you bring these two together is that you have care plans that emerge from uh, these conversations that make intellectual, practical, and emotional sense. There are things that, are, that people are actually going to be able to do and that we sometimes call it's care that fits. It's care that's going to fit into a patient's life. So you're not sending them off telling them to... Um, uh, take a medication that you maybe know in the, in the back of your head. They're not going to take 
they're not necessarily going to be able to afford or they're not going to be able, they're not committed enough to sort of begin to keep taking it. And so that's kind of our, our sort of view of the world. And what you start to see here is that then in this environment, patients feel seen and heard, clinicians feel connected to their purpose again. And if you start to look at these types of conversations, you see that, sorry, that you, um, that the conversations look different. So you might take 10 people who are living with diabetes and they might each have a different conversation. And to me, that's a sign that care is happening because you know those are individual people coming through the door. So they shouldn't necessarily be leaving with the exact same kind of care plan. Um, so this is kind of the world as we see it now, the world as we want to sort of hope it and move towards. And of course, in part because I'm a designer, um, our, our goal as an organization is to see this conversation, this time when clinicians and patients come together, as a place of action. What could we be doing to make this more likely, more, more possible for clinicians and patients to be able to do this work? I mean, you'll see up here I have kind of the two circles. There's like the, the inner circle that I think of as really the clinician and patient come together in a space, an exam room, say, or a hospital room, and there are things that we can do um, that can help clinicians and patients have better conversations in those spaces. Uh, and that's one area of action. Um, it's the area that's a little bit, um, it's the most accessible to us because it's really based on, on um, personal, you know, individual action and motivation. So it's about clinicians being able to make a decision to do something different or patients making a decision to do something different. And I think I'll show you some of the stuff we've created and there's a lot of opportunity there. But the, the bigger, and I think ultimately if we want to live in a world where we have careful and kind care for all, we have to tackle the bigger circle, which is the environment in which these, um, these conversations are happening. Um, that's often out of the control of the cl individual clinician or the individual patient. And that those things, while often invisible, are inflicting an enormous amount of control on what happens in those spaces. And so we see both of those places as a place of action. And so the first one, this, I put um, websites up here, our Patient Revolution website. Uh, and also a website called carethatfits.org. And all of these tools are available on, um, on these websites uh, for free. So you can certainly go and see them and kind of download them. And these are tools that we have helped design that um, support clinicians and patients when they come together and having a different type of conversation. So um, one of the tools up at the top that you see here is a, is a, um, a set of five open or kind of the first part of five open-ended statements um, for patients to fill out uh, to be able to talk about something that they want to um, share with their clinician. And the, the starts of those cards are, um, I would like to talk about, it's important to me because it may help you to know, I hope this conversation leads to, and I'm nervous this conversation will lead to. So uh, we were looking for a way, you know, clinicians, when many of you, when you're in training, you get to have practice patients, right, where you practice being able to kind of have a conversation. We were like, what if patients had the same opportunity? Like, what if they could practice uh, a little conversation before they had it with their clinician? And so this really simple tool um, was uh, an outgrowth of that as a way to a number of people on the panel this morning were talking about patients writing things down and writing down questions. And I think, I think questions are great. You should absolutely write down questions as a patient. But oftentimes, it requires a certain amount of knowledge even to be able to frame something as a question. Right? And so part of our goal here with this tool was to be able to have patients be able to speak in their own language from their own kind of point of view about what's going on in their lives. Um, a number of the other tools that you see up here are uh, shared decision-making tools for helping patients participate in conversations about their depression medications or their diabetes medications. And the big insight for us in, in designing those was um, often we initially started, my early versions of those tools were um, based on the medication. So it was like, here's everything about metformin, here's everything about insulin. But patients aren't coming to the place of shared decision-making 
one, knowing the names of the medications or understanding anything about this. Like it's not a good, I refer to it as not a good on-ramp, it's not a good entry point for patients. Um, and so uh, we ended up creating a set of issues cards, so things that were important to patients that um, might be a starting place. So with the depression medications, it was um, sleeping effects or weight effects or um, the stopping approach or the um, uh, effects on, on sexual performance. And so those are things that patients are potentially thinking about, know about, and they're a way into that conversation that then lets them help participate. And there's a whole bunch of others here. I'm around after and at the fair, and I'd be more than happy to share with you slash bore you with our many, many sort of things that we've created. But the idea is that we've been trying to do a lot of work um, to think about once we bring a clinician and patient together, what are the things that we could bring into that space um, or prepare the clinician or patient with before they come into that space that would make them it easier for them to have the conversation that they need to have that's relevant there. But there are real limitations to that, um, to that approach. And so the other kind of goal of our organization um, is that bigger outer circle. Uh, and this is where we're particularly kind of interested in doing more work because this is about um, changing those environments, the things that are shaping those environments. And those are more likely the policies, the systems, the culture that um, uh, impact what is even really possible in those spaces. And so as an organization, we have been building and kind of moving to doing that work. Um, and so we're getting ready to launch an education program. I think many of you that may work in healthcare organizations, if you within your care team or organization think you have an appetite to take on for some of this work, we are always looking for, for kind of partners. Um, we really believe that this kind of way forward is about collaboration. Um, we also have a fellows program, so we invite really anyone um, from, you know, clinicians, patients, caregivers, uh, kind of the breadth of people with both lived experience and professional experience to be part um, of a group, uh, a group of our fellows who comes together to help us shape the work that we do and make sure that it continues to be informed um, by the lived and professional experience of, of the people that we're working with. Um, and so... Uh, I'm gonna, um, so we, uh, we uh, our co-founder, Victor Montori, wrote a book called Why We Revolt, um, and uh, which is kind of our manifesto, why it's important. This is all of our contact information, so please feel free to reach out to me uh, if you wanna know more or if, if you're excited or interested in this type of work. Um, and with that, I will, um, I will pause, be quiet. <laughs> Well, while you pause, round of applause for Matt <laughs> Preston. Thank you so much. We have a little bit of time for a question or two. Um, I kind of wanted to go back to what you were saying, making sure that when the patients are in the room with the doctor, that they don't feel intimidated. So how can healthcare providers kind of have a more individualized conversation with them rather than, oh, well, this is the thing that you have, so we're gonna treat you with this type yeah. of thing. So one thing we know from research is that um, clinicians, uh, physicians in particular, um, tend to interrupt patients after 11 seconds. So you know, most start out with, what brings you here today? And then the patients start to gear up and then they get kind of get cut off, right? So I think there are, um, op like, just letting patients finish their stories is oftentimes a big, uh, you know, ca can be a small thing. Now again, I, I say this because it's very important to us as an organization. Um, like I was saying that inner circle that where clinicians and patients come together and that that's one of our focus areas. I think that um, if we can impact the largest circle, I think that that inner circle will happen so quickly <laughs> because Clinicians go into medicine because they want to care for the people who are in front of them. I, I don't, I, I, we don't have to teach anybody that. We don't have to, um, I, I don't see that that's like, 
that's just an innate part of being a human being, and I think it's also a huge part of why people go into medicine, to be able to care for the people that, uh, in their community. And patients want to be cared for, I think. So I don't, I don't think it will be hard if we can kind of create some, relieve some of these other pressures. But some of the things that, you know, we often encourage uh, clinicians to do if they just want to sort of start is to let patients finish their stories. I was reading something yesterday that was recommending, um, they called it, they were, uh, they were talking about a listening, but really were about attentiveness. And their, uh, his recommendation, this physician's recommendation, was to, to follow the, um, the phrases that you tend not to talk about. So I think the example he gave was um, that a patient might describe that they're having headaches that are, um, uh, they had an evocative phrase, but it was something like, I'm having headaches that are like, making me crazy or something like that. And he was saying that our general response is to say, okay, well, tell me about these headaches. When do they happen? What's uh, going on? He said, but not to follow driving me crazy. What does that mean? What, what, what does it mean that a headache is sort of driving you crazy? And that to potentially follow that sort of track of the conversation might lead you into a place of understanding and potentially thinking about treatment that might be very different. So I think those are options as well. Another one of the tools that we, um, that we had up there uh, was a, a tool that's called ICANN, um, and it asks patients kind of that they do maybe in the, in the exam room before they're in with their clinician to take a number of aspects of their kind of lived experience and to identify whether or not those things are a, um, a, a place of satisfaction or a place of burden or both. I think that was the beautiful innovation of this, this particular tool, was to say that something that is really fills you up might also be a pain sometimes. You know, your family may be a source of enormous joy, but also getting my kids to all of these things is also a pain. Um, and so I think it's about, I think sometimes we can think about health literacy as how do we um, help patients be able to understand the things that healthcare wants to tell them. And I think the other, and we heard from this morning, the kind of other flip side is how can we create space for the, the things that patients need to tell us and have us understand those things. And, the, and that doesn't mean having patients translate it into clinical speak, I think, necessarily. It's really about creating the space for their stories and understanding who they are as people. Thank you so much. Give it one more time for Maggie Gresson. Thank you so much. We definitely appreciate you.